Good morning. Happy Sunday. It's snowy around here, and most of our friends are in California today at the Religious Education Congress, so they're missing out, <laughs> or they're enjoying it elsewhere. Let's give thanks to the Lord for a beautiful day. Honestly, I love the snow. As we always do, let's begin with our prayer. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy will. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may, by his passion and cross, be brought to the glory of his resurrection. The same Christ our Lord. Amen. Today, I'm really excited to talk about the idea of fasting and kind of put a couple things together on this first Sunday of Lent, where we always hear about the temptation of Christ in the desert and a couple other things too. So let's dig in. I think that you may enjoy this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, through the yearly observances of Holy Lent, that we may grow in understanding of the riches hidden in Christ, and by worthy conduct pursue their effects. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, See, I am now establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, all the birds and the various tame and wild animals that were with you and came out of the ark. I will establish my covenant with you that never again shall, I, shall all bodily creatures be destroyed by the waters of a flood. There shall not be another flood to devastate the earth. God added, This is the sign that I am giving for all ages to come of the covenant between me and you and every living creature with you. I set my bow in the clouds to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will recall the covenant I have made between me and and you, and all living beings, so that the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all mortal beings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your, your covenant. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Your ways, O Lord, make known to me. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Remember that your compassion, O Lord, and your love are from of old. In your kindness, remember me because of your goodness, O Lord. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Good and upright is the Lord. Thus he shows sinners the way. He guides the humble to justice, and he teaches the humble his way. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Beloved, Christ suffered for sins once, the righteous for the sake of the unrighteous, that he might lead you to God. Put to death in the flesh, 
he was brought to life in the spirit. In it, he also went to preach to the spirits in prison who had once been disobedient, while God patiently waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few persons, eight in all, were saved through water. This prefigured baptism, which saves you now, is not a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert, and he remained in the desert for forty days, tempted by Satan. He was among wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And that's it for the temptation of Christ that we get in this year of the lectionary. In the other years, we get the rest of the story, either in Matthew or in Luke. And the rest of the story includes like what the temptations are. So just a reminder of what they are, because I think it matters. In Matthew, the order is that first it's bread from stones. <laughs> Obviously, these are kind of odd temptations. They're not, they're not obvious there's a lot to talk about like what they actually mean so bread from stones then high place and throw yourself down and the angels will pick you up and then finally all the kingdoms of the earth and if you worship me then you can be the king of all of them i guess I, again the temptations are not entirely obvious what they are or like why they are the temptations how are they temptations i'm not entirely sure Temptations to what? Well, there's a traditional understanding of them. In Luke, so next year, they're in a slightly different order. So first the bread from stones, then the uh, all the kingdoms of the earth and worship me, worship the Lord your Lord, God only. And then finally the coming down off of the high place. Well, the, the reason why they're temptations, okay, sure, it is kind of obvious, but... That's the thing. It's kind of obvious. All right, fine. Have some food, but you're supposed to be fasting. All right. Then the kind of the high place one is an interesting one. That's kind of the, the difficult one to talk about. Because what it's really talking about is a vice called worldliness. It's the same kind of thing that we can easily depend on the various machines in our lives working, whether they be our computers or our cars or our refrigerators or our coffee machines and all the rest of it, and kind of this being the kind of the center of our lives. Except that in the Temptation of Christ version, it's the angels who are the, you know, who are there to do the thing, which is to, in a way, reduce the um, respect for the trust in God and then like trust in the machine, as it were, the mechanism by which it works out. Okay, so there's that one. And then finally, this one of power, which is to be the ruler of all the things and all the places. That's the temptation, the temptation to power. Okay, fine. By and large, that's kind of what's going on there. And there's a connection to specifically to this 40-day thing, which we call Lent. So today, we also get this story about Noah and the Ark. Noah and the Ark is a story that we've probably known since we were kids. And it's a fun one. <laughs> but one of the kind of details that's interesting and does relate to Lent is that they're in the Ark for 40 days. 40 days of being uh, to, together with the family, Noah and seven others, his family, and all the animals, and so on, which 
there is a there is a parallel to the temptation of Christ, which is temptation of Christ happens at the end of Jesus alone in the desert versus Noah very much not alone on the water. Get it? It's like the opposite of things. And so there is a connection and both of them lead to, well, certainly some kind of temptation in there somewhere, especially with the Noah thing. The Noah thing is pretty obvious for anyone who's ever had to spend too much time with the same people locked up together. Like this, you know, this is going to be an unfortunate and unpleasant time. Okay, so that's enough about the about the ark. I want to talk about are these temptations. Now, coming back to I, I already given you the structure of the temptations. This is what they are in Matthew and Luke in slightly different order. This year we're reading Mark, which has none of the details, but still we can look at them, especially one of them in particular. So these three temptations also happen to line up to the three practices of Lent, of fasting, almsgiving, and prayer, all of which kind of go under the heading of penance. But the three practices of Lent, fasting, almsgiving, and prayer, line up to the three temptations of Christ. So the fasting one, sure, lines up to the first temptation, which is the bread one out of stones. That one's kind of obvious. Okay, so there's food involved. Then the worldliness one about the angels and the high place. That's actually connected to almsgiving. And I'll talk more about that in a second. I'm not talking about church. I'm just kind of saying I'm not going to talk about it in church because it's complicated. It's not an easy connection, but it's there. I'll show you. Then finally, the last one of world uh, of the of the cities of the world and all that worship me whatever says satan and jesus responds very you know cleverly you will worship the lord your god alone it is prayer because that's obvious it's like yeah worship of god alone that's what prayer is about so there's kind of a clear connection there too the unclear connection is the middle one of all these things. So in their dialogue, Jesus and Satan are very clever with each other. Both of them are quoting scripture very well. So, for example, with the middle one, it says, uh, say Satan is quoting the psalm, um, he will send his angels to guide you lest you dash your foot against a stone. Cool. And then Jesus says, you will not tempt the Lord your God, <laughs> which is Great. You know, that, that's nice. It's, it's clever how they're talking to each other. But so what? Well, the, the so what kind of matters a lot here, especially with the Lenten practice, specifically that of alms giving. When we give alms, we are literally giving away the thing which is the most worldly that we have, money. We are giving away the thing which is the most easily converted into the potential of doing all the other things and all the other things that we want money <laughs> so in much the same way as like i said the angels here are kind of like a machine that jesus is being tempted to use kind of like the way in which we use our phones our computers our cars our refrigerators our televisions and all the other things that are like a coffee machines that make our lives nicer and easier the reason why to give alms is to take away a little bit of the power that turns into those things that's the connection anyway but that's also kind of like not important really what i want to talk about is the first one fasting so happy lent welcome to the beginning of lent we've already had two kind of food days in lent one day of fasting ash wednesday one day of abstinence the first friday in lent so there's a difference fasting is well you can read all about it in the Lent guide. You know, there, there are lots of regulations to be had of uh, just exactly what the calculation is of how much food one can eat, whatever. You can find it. You can look it up. And whatever kind of one meal that doesn't add up to the two other smaller things in the fasting is not really what Lent is about. And also, it's not about 
not eating meat on Fridays. Don't eat meat on Fridays as part of the Lenten regulation. Again, you can find it in the Lent guide elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, do the Lenten things, but that's not what it's about. Lent is a fast. It is a fast. And it's not just on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. The fast of Lent is much more interesting. And it's easy to kind of reduce that to food in our minds. But that's really not what that's about. The fast of Lent, the giving something up of Lent kind of thing, which in the past I've noted, like the giving something up for Lent practice is a little bit puerile, and that's fine. But the reason why is because there's a lot more depth to what fasting is. It's not just giving something up. So this Lent, the scripture that is in the back of my mind is Isaiah chapter 58. It's a very short one. And since this is coffee, I'm going to read it. Now, it's all of 14 verses long. It's not long, but it's about the nature of fasting. It has kind of this interesting climax that goes a direction that you don't necessarily think it should just for the idea of fasting. So I'm going to read it. Shout loudly without holding back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Proclaim to my people their wicked deeds, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they search for me day after day, in their desire to know my ways, as if they are a nation that adheres to righteousness and has not abandoned the law of their God. They request that I make righteous judgments, and they long to be near God. They ask, why should we fast when you do not even notice? Why should we mortify ourselves when you pay no heed? The truth is that on your fast days, you serve your own interests and oppress all your workers. Your fasting only leads to quarrels and fights and lashing out with vicious blows. Such fasting as you currently practice will not make your voice heard on high. Is this the type of fast that pleases me? A day for a man to humble himself, to bow his head like a reed and lie in sackcloth and ashes? Is this what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Okay, so that's the first part that establishes what a fast is not. It's not self-centered. Great. Next part. This, rather, is the type of fast that I wish. To loosen the fetters of injustice, to undo the thong thongs of the yoke, to set free those who are oppressed, and to break every yoke to share your bread with the hungry and to offer shelter to the homeless poor, to clothe the naked when you behold them and not turn your back on your own kin. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your wound will quickly be healed. Your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Okay, so that's, we've heard that before. It's that idea that, yeah, Mercy is better than sacrifice. Again, we've heard this before, and it is, in fact, important. And it leads to this next part, which is the center of the chapter and quite, quite interesting, I think. Then, when you call, the Lord will answer. You will cry out for help, and he will say, here I am. If you cease to tolerate the yoke of oppression, the pointing of figures, and the malicious words. If you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like midday. Which, so that second part of that little middle section echoes what we just heard in the second section. But it's interesting for a couple reasons. First of all, if you do the fasting the right way, then not only will the Lord hear you, he will show up and make himself visible and say, here I am. Well, that's, an, that's a very interesting consequence. A, kind of a lot more than we are probably ready to handle at any given time. God just showing up, here I am. That's a lot. Also, these words, here I am, that's interesting to hear it from that perspective, because 
honestly, like we have that elsewhere in scripture, but it's Samuel who says it because he hears the voice of the Lord calling out to him, Samuel, Samuel. And then he goes to Eli. And Eli says, I didn't call you. Then he goes to the Lord because Eli said, aha, it's the Lord who's calling you. You should go to him. And so they talk and that becomes the beginning of prophecy in Samuel. Samuel saying, here I am. This isn't Samuel saying, here I am. This isn't Isaiah saying, here I am. This is the Lord saying, here I am. That's a very interesting change. The next part of this is about the nature of the Sabbath, which, again, since this is coffee, I'll read. Again, the whole chapter is all 14 verses long, nearly done. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in the barren desert. He will strengthen your limbs and you will be like a watered garden, like a spring whose waters never run dry. Your ancient ruins will be rebuilt, constructed on foundations from generations past. You will be called the rebuilder of broken walls and the restorer of ruined streets and dwellings. If you refrain from traveling on the Sabbath and from engaging in your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a day of joy and regard the Lord's holy day as honorable, if you honor it by not going your own way, serving your own interests, or attending to your own affairs, it's like saying the same thing three times just to make sure we really heard it, it also is a recapitulation of the first part of this chapter entirely, Except instead of talking about fasting, now we're talking about the Sabbath, talking about it exactly the same way. Then you will find a true happiness in the Lord, and I will enable you to ride upon the heights of the earth. I will nourish you with the heritage of your father Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Well, that's very interesting indeed. So there's this connection between kind of the right fasting and the celebration of the Sabbath. That both of these things then turn into blessing. But this whole direction that right fasting, which is not self-centered, but rather other-centered, which is based on charity, will lead to causing the Lord to appear. That's a lot. That is a very interesting result. Here we are on the first Sunday of Lent. Every year we hear about the temptation of Christ, and those temptations of Christ are those three things that we do during Lent. Fasting, almsgiving, prayer. The reason why the temptation of Christ is interesting is precisely because it sets up what that is, especially the fasting part, which is the clearest. Of them. And even this year, when we were only just reading Mark, one verse, he's in the desert, and that's that, then we still have the rest of this story that reminds us of what is going on, of the temptation of Christ. And in that, we also have this remarkable invitation to fasting, which, if we look at it kind of in a fuller way, has really little to do with food and a lot to do with the presence of God. So the first Sunday of Lent comes, and it is this time that we prepare for something. And of course, that something is for God to appear, whether that be on the crucifixion or the resurrection of Christ. And so in this Lent that we begin, this holy campaign of fasting and almsgiving and prayer, we have before us not just those practices, which are not meant to confuse us with their particularities, but rather this invitation to actually see the Lord. And it's precisely this which is before us, because it's really rather remarkable. When you call on the Lord, he will listen. When you cry out, God will say, here I am. And not just in a kind of vague sense, but certainly very directly when we encounter the Lord in his passion and in his resurrection at Easter. So in this Lent that we are beginning now on this first Sunday, when we talk about the temptation of Christ in the desert, we're setting up this really marvelous path 
So fast well and see the Lord because he will appear. I mean, that's, that's, that's a pretty cool kind of direction. And of course, what we do every year. But if we fast well, then we will also be there and the Lord will hear us and he will say, here I am. All right, cool. As we do, let's bring our prayers together now and offer them to the Lord that he will hear and answer us. For the Holy Father's prayer intention this month, that those suffering from terminal illness and their families receive the necessary physical and spiritual care and accompaniment. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our community, that during this season of Lent, we may grow in prayer and in, close, in closeness with our Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who bear the marks of shame or guilt, for all who need healing of interior wounds, that during this season they may find that healing through the cross of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the world, that the light of Christ may guide us all, that all people may ex experience his peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Gathering all our prayers in one, let us offer them in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us pray. May bountiful blessing, O Lord, we pray, come down upon your people, that hope may grow in tribulation, virtue be strengthened in temptation, and eternal redemption be assured. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and be with you forever. Amen. Great. Happy Sunday. See you again tomorrow. God bless. Bye-bye.